So in this week's video, I want to touch a little bit on some of the things I forgot to mention in one of last year's videos, where it was all about how to get the perfect exposure, the most optimal exposure when you are out in the field. And I'll come out to this beautiful swampy area with loads of gnarly root systems in these beautiful trees here behind me. It looks really, really nice. It has been kind of a frustrating, hectic morning because the light has been changing very, very fast. There haven't been as much atmosphere as I hoped for. So I've only got a few photos that I think are like pretty good and worth showing. And I will show those in the end of the video. But as I said, I want to touch a little bit on some of the few things that I didn't get to mention in last year's video on how to get perfect exposure. So the first thing, as you can see here, I have a little composition with some beautiful trees that are framing some background trees. I am in aperture priority up here, which means that I use my exposure compensation wheel to decide my exposure. And the thing I wanted to touch on is that in last year's video, when I said that the exposure is at zero, zero, I said that the camera or the exposure meter, the light meter in the camera, tries to expose for middle gray, 50% gray. Now, it is not 50% gray. Technically, it's called 18% gray. Now, there's a lot of math behind that. You can look it up yourself because it takes way too long time uh, for me to talk about it here in the video. So the point is that there is a distinction between reflection and exposure. I will link a video up here explaining it in more detail because we don't have time for that in this video. But it's simply just to get the technicals right because there was a lot of people who were correcting me in the comments of that video. So I just want to make sure that yeah, we are all on the same page. So one thing I didn't get to mention in last year's video on exposure is that when you're using your separate stripes, and I always use my separate stripes when I set them to 100. So when I have my separate stripes showing in my exposure, as you can see right here. So there we go. You can see over here, I have these stripes. Those are called separate stripes. When they are there, the exposure is fine. I'm not overexposing the camera. I can even put on my histogram. See, I do have a little bit of a spike here, and that's because some of the areas are overexposing. So I'll just turn down the exposure, and then it should be fine. There we go. Now, what I didn't get to mention is that what you're actually seeing on the back of your screen with the separate stripes is actually the separate stripes of your JPEG file. And since we're shooting in RAW, we do have a little bit more wiggle room to work with in the highlights than we do on a JPEG file. Now, I wouldn't go so far as to say that it is groundbreaking and you can just push your highlights even more, uh, even though you see the separate stripes on your screen. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference. And I would say as long as you expose it perfectly, there's probably only about a stop, maybe a little less than a stop to, to get. So I wouldn't count too much on it, but just be aware that you do have a little bit more wiggle room to work with since you're shooting raw. So there's actually a little group of deers right here. And I've tried to make a little composition where I'm framing them up between some trees. I think it looks really nice. Very nice. So this location here is actually really, really great for framing different composition. So I can use all these different trees here with their gnarly root system in the foreground. 
and then frame up something in the background. It can either be other trees, which I've done most of the morning with a little bit of sunbeams coming in, or in this particular case here, some deers. I think it looks, it looks really nice. The deers right now are a little bit too clustered. You can't see the individual deers, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> but it's really, really great for framing. And framing is something I use quite a lot in my landscape photography. And in forests, it's quite obvious. But if you want to learn even more about composition in landscape photography, be sure to get my ebook on composition landscape photography. And if you are happy about that one, be sure to get the follow up because it, it's the, the two ebooks are basically the same in the sense that they have nine chapters of on different compositional tools. And then they have a final chapter where I like put it all together and they have different compositional tools in all those chapters. So the second ebook is basically just building up on top of the first one. So be sure to check those out. You can get the free light versions of these ebooks down in the description of this video if you want to check them out before you buy them. There's of course also links to get the full version. So check those out if you want to learn even more about composition and landscape photography. So one thing I got asked in the comments of the last video was whether I would always bracket my photos just to be sure that I got all the information in the highlights and the shadows or I would just try to optimize the exposure for each shot instead of getting three exposures just get one and try to optimize it. For the most part I try to optimize my exposures uh, so I don't get like three times as many photos on my hard drive as I need to have. So in that way, yeah, I just try to optimize the exposure. Yeah, I think that's the most obvious thing to do. If you're in the forest and if you're in a high dynamic range scene, you could go with the bracketing option. But for the most part, I just optimize each exposure and try to get one that works. If you enjoy this video, if you feel you benefit from this video, I would highly appreciate a like while you're down there. I would also highly appreciate a comment. If you think other people can learn something from it, you're more than welcome to share the video. All this engagement really, really helps out pushing this video out to even more people on YouTube. So if you think you benefit from my videos, I would highly appreciate yeah, if you shared them, told your friends, photography friends, your photography club members. Now, the absolutely biggest misconception that I could see in the comments of my exposure video was that a whole lot of you out there have gotten the impression by viewing landscape photographers on YouTube or photographers on YouTube where it is being said, and I've heard this also before, that it's better to underexpose your scene than overexpose it because you can easier bring out the details of the shadows than the highlights. And it has, this has apparently given a lot of people the impression that you would rather want to underexpose by one stop, maybe two stops, and then bring out all the shadows so you still have the highlights. Now that's not exactly how you should understand that tip. Now, as you can see here, I have this exposure here with this composition. I, I love this tree here with this hole. It looks super cool and a hole in this tree too. Really, really nice. But how to understand it is, you can see my histogram right here. And obviously most of the information is on the left side of the histogram, which means this is my shadow area. So that's the trees uh, right there. I'll just turn this one on again. 
So that's the trees right there. And then I of course have all the highlight information here on the right. There's not a whole lot of it. It is up in the trees and in the highlight areas there. But the point is you don't want to either clip your shadows. That means that you are taking a part of your photo where it's just completely black. Even though you bring up the exposure in post-processing, it's just completely black or it will be gray or brown or something like that. Neither do you want to clip your highlights, which means that everything's just completely white. There's no information left. If you bring down the exposure in Lightroom, Camera Raw, whatever, then it's just white or gray as you bring down the exposure. So no information at all. That's what you want to avoid. Now, underexposing your scene, in that way you obviously make sure that you're not overexposing or clipping your highlights. But the problem by underexposing is that you get the penalty of increased noise. You always want to expose to the right, but without clipping the highlights. So if you want everything in one exposure without bracketing the photo, you want to expose to the right. You want to have as much light onto your sensor as possible. And remember, getting an optimal, getting a perfect exposure is not a question about probability. You have the tools available to see whether you are clipping your highlights or not. The separate stripes and the histogram. Use those tools and then expose to the right so you get as much light onto your sensor so you get as clean as photo as possible. Obviously there's plenty of times where you have to increase the ISO and have a noisy photo if you want to capture something flying fast or running fast or something like that. But the point is you do not want to underexpose your scene because it makes no sense. You get the penalty of noise and reduced color depth. You want to expose to the right. Okay, I think you got the point now. You want this much light onto the sensor. As app, okay, okay. Um, so <laughs> let's just talk composition because a lot of deer are running into my scene right now. All the deers in the entire park <laughs> they're running straight through my scene right here. Not really sure I can use them for anything in this composition, but well, nice. <laughs> Little bit of an experience. Holy moly. Okay, I just had to think fast with all those deer running into my scene and to capture them. Uh, while standing still, I had to up the ISO quite a lot. As I just talked about, <laughs> I had upped it all the way up to like ISO 1600 or something like that. Um, I did actually manage to capture one deer standing still, so it may have been a little bit redundant shooting at ISO 1600. Um, I also brought down my aperture to like f8, and that gave me also a, a fast shutter speed, so I could capture those deers. The problem is that my scene has a relatively deep depth of field. So I think I will have to yeah, use several shots where I'm shooting at f16, where I, as you can see here on the back of my screen right here, so where I focus on the foreground tree and then I focus on the middle ground here and then I focus on the deers that had been running here behind the, the cool tree. And I maybe have that single deer standing right here. So I will have to put those, or blend those photos together in, uh, in Photoshop afterwards. If you want to learn how I edit my photos and I do a blend like this, be sure to enroll in my huge Photoshop for Landscape Photographers post-processing course. Here I show you all my editing tricks from beginner to advanced. I've designed the course to be very progressive so we start out easy. I introduce you to the programs so you don't panic each time you open Photoshop. And then I just teach you all the way through how I blend images, how I edit with luminosity masks, how I add glow and atmosphere, how I use contrast in the scene. I show you what mistakes to avoid, in many different ways that you can use all these editing tools. So there is a discount code down in the description. Be sure to use that one to get a little bit off, save a little bit of money. 
And uh, yeah, I think that's all for now. Here are the rest of the photos that I, have, I haven't shown yet. I've captured this morning. Enjoy! Mm -hmm.